I left my command in June. That is already, it, it feels like yesterday, but it is also months uh, since I was there. That in the Middle East, it, a couple of days, a couple of weeks can uh, be transformative, can be years of, of change. And I don't pretend to be as knowledgeable or as immersed in what is happening, what has happened on the intelligence side and on the events since I left. I have tried to kept, keep some awareness through the same means that you would be aware following the news and, and so on. But again, please don't hold me to account for what has transpired since I left command in June would be my first point. The second, um, I, I realize that I'm coming to you in, in uniform and, and flags and official capacity and so on, but I do take these opportunities and these talks to kind of present to you some of my opinions. And I want you to hear some of the comments and commentary that I make and hold it as an opinion. And please uh, protect my, me and myself from my own words. And uh, I, I would ask you to be kind and not reuse them to, widely or publicly and say, General St. Louis said this and this about what Canada is doing in the Middle East. And therefore it is X, Y, and Z. Um, it, it is more of a Michel-Henri St. Louis. It is my opinion based on what I saw. And I would like you to, to protect me against my own words in, in that realm. But I, I will try to give you as much character and texture uh, from my uh, sense of what I saw there. Don't, with that being said, I, I think it is important as we talk about Joint Task Force impact that we put ourselves back in the time and space where we were in October 2020, uh, in October 2014. So October 2014, if you think, think back in a matter of a couple of days, two Canadians were actually killed under the hand of fellow Canadians that had espoused this movement, the ideology, the, 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 the group that was Daesh, that is Daesh, and these fellow Canadians went after other serving members on Canadian soil. In Saint Jean on the 20th of October, Adjudant Vincent was mowed down by a car with a fellow Canadian in it that had been waiting for a couple of hours outside Tim Hortons. And after um, that perpetrator mowed Adjudant Vincent and two other Canadian serving members down, uh, he tried to escape, was pursued by police, was run off the road, was uh, shot as he tried to lunge la at a police person, later died of his wounds. Adjudant Vincent also the next day died of his wounds uh, from that car uh, accident. Only two days later, Corporal Cirillo, while on sentry at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Ottawa, was shot in the back, point blank, by a fellow Canadian who has espoused Daesh, who fled and ran into the parliament building, shot a parliament guard in the foot on his way into the building and had designs to shoot uh, parliament members. He was cornered in a hallway. He was brought uh, down by uh, the security force in the parliament. He died, but Corporal Cirillo also died from the wounds inflicted um, at the tomb of the unknown soldier. So within the context of what was happening in the region, this movement that had come out of northern Syria had grown in size and scope and was moving into Iraq. There was worldwide repercussions to this that we felt in Canada by these two actions. And by November 2014, our government had mobilized the Canadian Armed Forces to be part of this coalition, this effort of more than 70 nations that came together to turn back the tide of Daesh, to contain this regional destabilizing element that was having impacts in Turkey, in Northern Africa and other European countries had, was forcing refugee movement and displaced personnel and was threatening destabilizing Iraq itself. They were on the move, taking up, gobbling up territory. 2014, after we, have these two Canadian um, serving members killed. The government mobilizes the Canadian Armed Forces. It first starts with a strategic airlift 
humanitarian relief and military cargo movement effort with C-17s into the region, quickly evolves it into having a special forces presence in Northern Iraq, partnering with the Kurds, Kurd army to hold and stop the advance on the ground of the Daesh expanding movement. We join the air power element or the air effects element of the coalition delivering ammunition or delivering ordinance from the CF-18s. We support the CF-18s with refuelers. We send a platform that provides intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. CP-140 uh, Aurora is there. And together, those two are kind of the main elements of our contribution, part of the air power effort of the coalition to stop Daesh and the ground advise and assist support to the ground forces that was trying to stop the advance of Daesh. That effect, that mission has had a number of evolutions of changes through the years that brought me five years later in 20. 19 to take command of a mission that had expanded from this focus of defeating Daesh into a regional footprint, into a regional um, effects where the contribution of the Canadian Armed Forces in Jordan, in Lebanon, and in Iraq were all tied to the headquarters where I was based out of Kuwait. And from Kuwait, with command and control headquarters element, with intelligence, with log logistician sustainment, with the two Hercules that provided intra-theater airlift. We were responsible to support the footprint that we now have in Iraq that had changed from air power delivery to footprint within the US-led coalition, CJTF OIR, Operation Inherent Resolve, and the NATO mission in Iraq that had taken form in 2019 to train the Iraqi security force. And we were supporting them from this command node support hub in Kuwait. But we also had inherited the training piece, the assistance, the development or helping support host nations in Lebanon and in Jordan help to professionalize their army. They all came under this headquarters where we have moved away from air power, air centric, air delivery of effects to defeat Daesh Daesh had been stopped and then defeated out of Iraq. It was still an insurgency, but the mission had grown in scope, had changed in scope to be a capacity building mission where from a regional command and control node in Kuwait, we had effects and responsibilities across the region. That is what I take over in May, 2019. From May, 2019 to November, 2019, the dynamic in the Middle East, the dynamic of the mission is impacted by some, some shifts in the relationships of some of the warring factions in Iraq themselves. And what you saw was the regional dynamic of Iran growing its influence across proxies, across different countries, and how that was being played out in Iraq itself was one of the key components of the first four or five months of my tour. In the fight against Daesh, in the turning back and the stopping and then turning back Daesh, one of the key uh, elements that came to help the Iraqi government, in addition to the coalition, in addition to this US-led coalition effort, was the standing up of the Shia militia groups. What I will refer to as the SMGs, the Shia militia groups were a key element, paramilitary element that came together with the Iraqi security forces and the coalition to turn back, stop, and then defeat Daesh. This balance of previous enemies coming together to fight a new enemy was kind of broken by 2019. And the Shia militia groups directed directly or indirectly acting as proxies of the um, a more belligerent posture between Iran and the US were no longer uh, willing to accept that continuing presence of US forces on uh, Iraqi soil. And therefore was changing the presence, the acceptance of the presence in the country. Furthermore, in the region, through those first four months, there were a number of discrete events that pointed to that increased tension between uh, Iran and the US. 
you would have remembered the strike against a Saudi Arabia oil refinery, where there is a, a direct impact on the economy of the world from this action that blew up a Saudi refinery that is assigned responsibility to Iran. You have ships anchored along the UAE coast that are torpedoed mysteriously, again, assigned to Iranian uh, responsibility. You have the insurgency or internal conflict in Yemen, where Saudi Arabia and Iran are kind of at each other through proxies in that area. And if you turn around the peninsula on one side and go through Iraq into Syria on the other, you continue to see the influence of Iranian proxies in Iraq, in Syria, and then continue it in Hezbollah through Lebanon. And that's crescent of increasing Iranian presence, Iranian activity through proxies, proxies, their unwillingness to accept continued US presence in Iraq is what is the backstage of the first four or five months. This comes to a head by November. And in some of my timelines that I presented to you, by November 2019, there is now regular and repeated rocket attacks on US coalition bases. The bases and footprint of the coalition in Baghdad, in Taji, in Erbil are regularly under fire by these Shia militia groups. And the Iraqi security force is unable to curtail them and contain them. We were lucky for a number of months. There's no um, casualties from this. This comes, this actually changes by November where a US contractor is killed at the base uh, that is a KH. And there's, a, there's actually contractors and other um, service members that are wounded by December in some of these strikes. So by this time, these strikes had increased in frequency. We, now we start seeing a casualty in a contractor, wounded soldiers from the US. The backdrop is continued civil unrest that has broken out in Baghdad with riots in the street in October and November. Civil unrest in Lebanon where riots break out in the street in October and November in kind of a second Arab Spring kind of feel to the whole region in October and November. The casualties by December point to an escalation of this tension and this violence. The threat uh, of further escalation uh, comes to a head where when the US retaliates from the casualty that it suffered in its one civilian contractor and service members, and it retaliates in Western Iraq in a place that they knew Kits Hezbollah, K, um, KH, which is one of the SMGs that was being the most active in its uh, rocket attacks against US-led uh, bases. Well, they are targeted by US assets and a number of them die. Tit for tat, the strike result in violent protests in front of the embassy. They result in a very real concern that everything's gonna go south by the end of December, that you're gonna have a repeat of Benghazi, you're gonna have a run on the embassy, you have a, a wall being breached, and you're gonna have a real firefight in downtown Baghdad. That does not happen, notwithstanding that increase of tension. And in then a, a response to the response, the US hits um, Soleimani and Mohandas in the vicinity of the Baghdad International Airport. And, and that is, a comp again, a game changer, an escalation of the tension. Soleimani, if you remember, was the commander of the Quds forces, the, 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 the forces that are seen as being the puppet masters of all of this activity in the region, of kind of being seen the, as the general that holds the levers and pulls the strings on what happens in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, across that area. And the US has had enough, strikes him, and strikes the commander of the Kits Hezbollah, the KH, uh, Mohandas in Baghdad. 3rd of January, everyone holds their breath, Again, if we can keep on holding our breath, which we have been doing since November, and we expect Iran to respond. 
this is a strike on their honor. This is a strike on their interest. And there is going to be, we expect a response. Alert levels go up. We reposition the force. We brace for impact. And the impact uh, comes uh, later in January. Before the response, though, there's a non-binding vote in Iraq. And if you believe that we are there as a coalition of like-minded nations or Western nations coming together to defeat Daesh at the request of the Iraqi government, there's a non-binding vote in parliament that then says we want the US and we want the coalition out of Iraq. It is a non-binding vote. There's no government. The government has been in turmoil since the civil unrest started in October, November. But nonetheless, it signals some challenge for a coalition that is there to develop the Iraqi security forces if the parliament has now voted, um, even if it's non-binding, to have us leave. But then the retaliation that we were all expecting happens on the 8th of January. And interballistic missiles rain on uh, a couple of locations in Iraq. They rain on Assad Air Base and on Erbil International Airport. Thankfully, luckily, there's no casualties, uh, immediate casualties from those strikes. There's a number of uh, concussions and wounded that will be taken care of, but there's no loss of life on that night, which kind of takes away maybe the requirement for a, a re-escalation and a re-response from this tit for tat that had been happening since December. The other element that kind of stopped the tit for tat escalation that would have continued is that that same night, the Ira Iranian air defense elements were on full alert, expecting a response from their interballistic missile strike. And there's a mistake that happens that night. There's a civilian Ukrainian air liner that gets shot down out of the sky. A number of Canadians are actually killed. And it puts a cold shower on the whole situation. And kind of the, the tragedy embarrasses the Iranian authorities, kind of, takes away the need to respond from the US because there's been no casualties. There's now this tragedy to deal with. And luckily, there is no immediate or further escalation of events. We remain on edge. We remain on standby. And there's a recurrence of rockets later on in January and in March. But that is kind of how we started the year on the mission in January 2020. When, when I think back on it, feels like it was yesterday. But in some respect, it feels like it was decades ago for me. We stay on edge in January and February. We, uh, we, we, we reposture the force. We are leery of what's going to transpire with the Shia militia groups that have lost their commander, Muhandis, earlier in, in the year. But then we are faced with then a new uh, enemy. As we were dealing with the physical enemy that was the Shia militia groups and the Iranian proxies, we now have to deal by February and March with the threat of the COVID uh, pandemic and how the Middle East was going to respond to it. If you think of that evolving impact of our mission from an air power delivery mission to a capacity building mission by 2019, if you are in a country that is no longer sure it wants you there to develop their capability, if you are on the threat of rocket attack and you, now you are unable to be in proximity to the force that you are helping because of COVID mitigation measures, our efforts were on pause. Our efforts had to be rethought. We husbanded the force. We repositioned the force. We ensured that we were protected from pro la propagation, the spread of the virus, to be able to respond or cater to whatever eventuality would come next, which at that time we didn't know what it would be. Our efforts to help the Lebanese army and the Jordanian army are put on pause as we kind of wrap our mind against what we're going to do with COVID. And the same is applied in Iraq. So from a headquarters in Kuwait perspective, it was all about protecting the force, husbanding the force, repositioning the force as much as we could, and also being ready to help Canada if there was a need in Canada to be part of a response to this pandemic. As I gave command to General Mike Wright, who took over at the end of May, we had repositioned hundreds of soldiers. We have moved hundreds of tons of equipment. We have returned helicopters to Canada that we thought Canada was gonna need as it repositioned for whatever pandemic response it needed to do. And 
we were husbanding our efforts to be ready to return to capacity building when capabilities or conditions would allow, which General Wright eventually was able to do as we came to learn how to operate with the pandemic. We learned what to put in place in terms of measures and slowly the Jordanian army, Lebanese army and Iraqi army came back to some capacity building efforts. The regional dynamics that were I play in addition to the time I've spent talking about Iran and its ability or willingness to exert its influence through its proxies points to an area where four regional actors were at each other. And they all had different interests, different um, things that they were pursuing. And I would suggest to you that Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Israel were four countries with competing and diverging interests in the regions that were at play. I would suggest to you that the Middle East, while I was there, was a place where two superpowers were using conflicts and proxies to go at each other, and that is the US and Russia. And I will add a third. I will add that China was using the opportunity afforded to it to come from kind of the back door and into the Gulf area and make its presence felt with economic investment and maybe feel a vacuum from a perceived uh, move from the US to retrench and retreat from the area and China was coming in. So you had superpowers that were at play. You had Daesh that was still a fledging or uh, had the remnants of what it was at its height in 2015 that was still there. And then as I left the theater, coming to, to grab grips with the COVID virus and what we were gonna do in delivering capability and stability in the region was the regional dynamics that we had to face while I was there. And, and those dynamics we faced as part of the Canadian Middle Eastern strategy. So maybe in the question period, I'll, I'll expand on this, but the Canadian Armed Forces effort are not done in isolation. They are done as part of two larger coalitions in Iraq, that is the US-led coalition, CJTFOIR, and the NATO mission in Iraq, the training effort. And then for our own strategy and our own national interest on a binational nature, in Jordan and in Lebanon from our hub in Kuwait. And we were delivering on this evolving strategy that our government had that uh, was this Middle Eastern strategy, $3.5 billion. The Middle East is the largest recipient of aid, focus and effort of the Canadian government. At least it was when I was there. And it had a portfolio where it was moving humanitarian assistance for, to the tune of one point something billions dollars. It was developing development assistance for gender equality and helping governance and social services. It had a support to diplomatic engagements in the region to gain back influence and footholds across the region. And then the larger security footprint and security effort of which my mission was part of. But my mission is only one effort in the Middle East. There are other places where we were de deployed and working towards achieving some of these uh, objectives of this strategy. And you, had, you have a mission in Egypt that is there as observers for the peace that endures since the 1980s between Egypt and Israel. We are contributing to the UN mission in Israel that supervises Lebanon, Syria, and Northern Israel. That's been there for more than 50 years. We are deployed, if you still include Cyprus, in the Eastern Mediterranean as part of this region, we still have an officer in the, that UN mission there, but we have a footprint in headquarters in Bahrain, in Qatar, in UAE, which are command and control nodes for the US-led efforts, CENCOM-led efforts in the area. And those command and control nodes in Bahrain, UAE, and Qatar, at the end of my tour, wind up put under the command and control of Joint Task Force Impact. So that regional command and control hub that is Kuwait grew its area of operation to then include the hubs and command and control elements all the way into the Gulf. So it's, it, I'd like to keep in mind that the Joint Task Force Impact operates under this larger whole of government strategy for the Middle East and whole of government budget of uh, efforts in the Middle East. But for our mission specifically, the capacity building effort was done directly and binationally in Jordan and in Lebanon, 
but it is done under the two coalitions that are the US-led coalition in Iraq and the NATO mission in Iraq. And we contribute forces to which I supported and enabled from my headquarters. And lastly, um, I, I, will, I, will, I will not get into the vignettes. You have a couple of slides that speak to some of the successes and specific things that I think we move forward or have moved forward since being deployed in that area, or we move forward in the time, 14 months that I was afforded um, the, the command of this incredible mission. But maybe the questions will afford me the opportunity to get back to them and give you some of those vignettes of what the men and women uh, have done. With, with that, uh, uh, Mr. Osborne, again, thank you for you, your patience, and your teammates that have joined you. I hope that those 30 minutes uh, were useful and will lead to maybe a 20, 25 minute uh, session of, of Q&A that you will find as useful from your audience. I am all ears. Hey, thank you very much, sir. That was certainly very informative. I'm gonna stop the recording.